Hi everybody. You all happy to be here? It's a bit wet, but reminds me of home, so that's good. Um, and it's really exciting to be here in Manitou. Um, oh, so you can see that. Um, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this um, workshop and this event. Um, we hope it's going to be really interesting for you and really informative and also that you can provide your comments and participate um, to inform this plan. Um, so I'm going to go forwards and talk about what I'm going to um, talk about. Um, so first of all, I'm going to overview of uh, plan goals, looking at the stakeholder groups um, and process. Um, we actually had a really good input from, we had a stakeholder group of a vast number of different organizations and a technical group as well that really helped guide this project. Um, I'm going to then go over the key, um, key project components and input, a bit on existing conditions, um, what it's like now, what we want it to be in the future. Um, and then I'm going to really dive into what we did, how we came up with these routes that you're, you're you've seen uh, today um, and the process that we went through to get to that point. I'm going to touch on funding sources. I mean, if we don't have funding, then nothing's going to get built. So we really want to um, have these, uh, these funding sources, let you know what they are, see how you can help in helping us build this and implement this system and this network. Um, we also have come up with a a number of supporting documents and everything that we have produced is on the website so if you're here and you're like oh I'd like to know a bit more detail about this a bit more detail about that if you go on our website go to documents you can download everything that's been output from this project and you can read it at your leisure um, we've also done an economic impact report on cycling in the region um, and that's a really interesting document that shows if we did increase cycling numbers this is how much um, impact we'd have on the local economy, the, the positive impact of cycling on the local economy. Um, I'll then go into how to participate and then uh, questions, which will be at the end. So the goals. Right at the start of this project, which seems a very long time ago now, back in 2013, um, we had a few key goals and objectives that we wanted to meet to make sure that this project was a success. Um, the first one, very important, was to establish a continuous and coordinated uh, regional non-motorized transportation that actively increases cycling and walking. Um, a number one um, um, condition that came up from my existing conditions report was that we have some really good infrastructure in the region, but it's not necessarily connected. So you find yourself dumped at the end of a trail or at the end of a bicycle route or a bicycle lane. And we wanted to try and get past that. We wanted to create a network that was fully connected and that you could get from A to B um, using this network. One of our other key aims was to reduce the number of pedestrian and cyclist accidents and crashes. Um, quite a number of people still die on the roads um, in terms of cycling and, and, walk and pedestrians especially in this region, and we really wanted to tackle that to try and mitigate those crashes and those accidents, those deaths and those serious injuries in the region. Um, encourage organizations to improve traffic safety, education, and enforcement, and all this came out through our coordinated effort. This is a, an effort that brings together a number of different organizations to pull together and create this um, plan that will go forward and has everybody's buy-in and so will go forward for implementation. And we wanted to, everyone to work together to try and raise the standard um, across the board. Um, another goal, in promote public awareness. Um, and that's part of why you're here. We wanted to get this out to people. We wanted the public to be involved. Um, we created a website so anyone could go and see what was going on. Um, and just introduce more people to cycling, walking, and other non-motorized modes and how it benefits you and how you can get from A to B to your place of work relatively easily through cycling or walking. And then creating an environment where bicycling and walking are true attractive modes. So we wanted to get to a point where you could choose to drive your car to work, but actually it might be quicker and it's definitely better for your health 
um, to cycle or to walk. And we wanted to have that ingrained in this. So we really um, focused on making those links between uh, where people live and where people work um, and really making those links for cycling, walking, and non-motorized transportation better. And those were what we started with. Those were our goals. Another part of this, um, so not only did we do a regional plan through this process, we also produced three sub-plans. Those sub-plans are um, a, the bicycle, uh, a cycle City of Colorado Springs Bicycle Master Plan, um, which um, if you go to Station 5, you can learn a lot more about. Um, also El Paso County Non-Motorized Plan, and also the City of Woodland Park Non-Motorized Plan. So these three sub-plans fall under the umbrella of the regional plan and fed into this whole process. This is our study area. It's pretty significantly huge. Um, and trying to work out, this is what we had to start with. How do you prioritize cycling, walking, non-motorized transportation in such a vast and different area? You see here we have places like Falcon, um, Ellicott, these places are completely very different from downtown Colorado Springs, which is very different from downtown Manitou Springs, which is very different from Woodland Park. So we had to try and mix all these together to make sure that the plan um, connected everything up. We had a really robust stakeholder input. As you can see, we, have, we had numerous um, meetings, dates, um, stakeholders, uh, technical groups, um, we went through CAC, TAC, Board of Directors, and very importantly, the public. These are a list of the priorities that came out of our initial stakeholder engagement. This is what the public, this is what stakeholders, technical um, work for, uh, task force members wanted to see come out of this plan. Focus on connectivity, as I was saying. It can be fragmented out there standardize infrastructure across the jurisdictions so you don't end up starting on a trail in El Paso County and getting to Colorado Springs and then suddenly the, the standard changes completely. We wanted to standardize the whole process, the whole, the whole infrastructure. Wayfinding again was very important. How do you get to a place where you can have a regional wayfinding system uh, so you can get to where you want to go and use that information to get to your destination? And this is really the, the key piece here, is to produce a long-term strategy for non-motorized transportation in the region going forward. And then, importantly, we focused on the Front Range Trail as the spine of the non-motorized network. The Front Range Trail is an excellent resource. It's a fantastic trail in the region that connects from north to south. Um, and we wanted to highlight that as a very important piece of the non-motorized infrastructure and really connect to that. So use that as the base to build on our successful non-motorized plan. This is the process we've been through so far. Um, we've gone through existing conditions. Um, we, then, we then came up with 71 regional corridors, and I'll go into that a bit more detail in a bit. We prioritized, we created prioritization criteria where we took that 71 corridors Take, took it through prioritization uh, to really highlight the key corridors that we wanted to see improvements on. Um, again, I'll go into the, a bit more detail later on in the presentation. Um, and then we produced recommended alignments and improvements. And you can see the recommended alignments on the board at the back. Um, and then we developed the draft non-motorized plan, which is available to download on the website. I'm just going to shoot through existing conditions. This is what we saw when we came out and audited the region. Um, small pockets conducive to non-motorized transportation, but specifically in this region, you've got some really big roads with loads of traffic going very fast, and that makes it difficult to use walk, walking and cycling and non-motorized travel around the region. Because as soon as you start walking and you hit that road, you're just going to be like, well, that's unsafe. I'm just going to get my car and drive through. Um, so we found that the motorized network was really is the um, barrier almost to developing our non-motorized network. 
Um, but within the confines of those roads, you actually had really good conditions within neighborhoods um, and pockets elsewhere in the region. There's a culture of walking and cycling in the, in the region. It's, a, it's an active culture. We're in Colorado, people love to go hiking, love to go cycling. How do we grasp onto that? How do we get that and get people, instead of as well as cycling in the mountains, also to cycle to work? How do we get people not only hiking Pikes Peak, but also walking to work or walking to the bus? Um, again, some excellent examples of trails, the Pikes Peak Greenway, which is also the Front Range Trail. Um, and also we identified a lack of east-west connectivity. North-south you have the Front Range Trail, but east-west is pretty lacking. And making that crossing, especially at I-25, it's a major barrier to non-motorized transportation. Um, sidewalk condition varied uh, significantly. Um, here's very close to Manitou Springs, um, where you have a bus stop kind of stapled to a telegraph pole with no sidewalk. Um, and so this is kind of a, how do we improve this? How do we make it easier for people to get to that bus stop and safer? Um, and varying standards of infrastructure across the region. It really depends where you are as to the quality of the trail, quality of the sidewalk, or quality of your um, route. And we wanted to try and standardize that more so that you got a better um, user experience throughout the region. So this is what we ended up with. This is 71 improvement corridors that cross the region. Each of these corridors have, has a load of data behind it explaining why it was selected. A lot of them connect schools, uh, high em uh, employment places, places of um, resident high, high density of residential, um, and also key destinations like downtown Colorado Springs or Falcon or uh, old Colorado City or Manitou Springs um, or Monument, all these places that we wanted to connect. So this is really what we'd like to see as the blueprint for the future. So this is what we'd like in many years to have completed having non-motorized infrastructure throughout the region so you can go anywhere you want and you feel safe and you'll find a quality um, facility for yourself to cycle or walk. Once we got those 71 improvement corridors down, we then took them through a quite a robust prioritization process. Now the criteria that we used was that we're actually formed by the stakeholder group and the technical group. So we, we worked with them to help understand what the priorities were in the region. And then we formed criteria to prioritize these corridors. So we had 71 corridors and we prioritized all of them um, to the criteria that we set. These criteria were in four main themes. Connectivity, mobility, deliverability, and livability. And you can find out more about those if, we, if you go over to that board and, and ask somebody, you could, they can tell you a bit more about what went into the, those criteria. So, we went through that, we used the criteria, we prioritized those 71 corridors, and this is what we ended up with the top 11 uh, corridors in the region. And then we worked with the city and with the various jurisdictions to identify the alignments for each of them. So this is the prioritized route network for now. This is what we want to focus on. This is what we want to get done. We want to have a standardized, non-motorized network that looks like this in the near future. Um, and again, after this, we can talk in more detail at the map if you want to go into further detail about that. Um, funding sources. There's a number of, of funding sources available. Um, state and federal funding, um, the PPRTA, uh, lottery funding as well. Um, there's a lot of work for non-motorized uh, facilities. And we can also work with jurisdictions to incorporate these improvements in larger scale highway improvements. So when they're starting to resurface a main road that has one of these routes on, we can say, hey, you're resurfacing this road. We want uh, you to implement this particular improvement for non-motorized transportation while you're doing that. Um, also on the website, there's a whole ream of supporting documents that we uh, produced. 
uh, existing conditions, corridor reports, peer seat review. We've got a design standard toolkit. You can look at the sorts of things that we would re recommend putting in the region, uh, wayfinding and an economic impact report. All of this is available online. You can download it and you can read it. It's all freely available. Now I'm going to jump into something slightly different. Uh, this is the economic impact report that we conducted for the region. Um, from this, we used a program called Implan, which is used throughout the US uh, to identify the economic impact locally of a specific mode. So in this case, we looked at cycling. We found that cycling contributes about $28 million to the local economy in the region. Um, and a lot of that was from people visiting the region and going to use um, the natural environment that we have, going hiking, cycling, and really trying to emphasize that and build upon that, make that better, you're gonna get more visitors and you're gonna get more people spending money in the region. There is a real, you have a real opportunity here in the region to invest in cycling, invest in cycling infrastructure to increase more people to come and spend their money in the local uh, region, in the local environment, local businesses. Um, and if we invest in cycling, we see that we get a, um, for every $1 invested, we get uh, $1.80 $1 or $2.70 in return. So it pays for itself investing in cycling. So that's very quickly running through a two-year project um, that had a lot of effort, a lot of people's work, and a lot of um, focus dedicated to it. Um, now I'd like to hand it over to you to participate in this project. Uh, we have a few stations dotted around the room um, where you can go. The first one is orientation, so it'll tell you where um, the project area was. Uh, explain our process. Then we have station two, which shows you the priority routes that we have. You can also have a look at the 71 corridors that we identified. Um, and we can also talk a bit more about criteria over there as well. Um, station three, uh, you can add your own sticky notes to what you think is the highest priority corridor or uh, route um, in the region from the top 11 and explain why. Um, and then, uh, sorry, station three as well is the, we have a website where you can put a comment anywhere in the region, anything to do with non-motorized travel, um, and that'll be captured and we'll feed that back into the project. Station four is uh, Colorado Springs focused. That is the Colorado Springs um, bicycle master plan. Um, and that fits very well with the regional plan. It kind of complements it very well. Um, and so if you want to learn more about that, you can go head over there and talk to our city representatives. And station five, tell us what you want to do. Tell us how you can help us uh, make this a reality. Um, how can we implement this? Um, we need your support. Uh, we need you to, to help us find the funding to build this, um, build this system. Um, Oh, and there's comment forms over on this side as well if you want to just get down with a pen and pa paper and write down exactly what you think. You can do that over there and put it in the, in the box and we'll uh, collate those after. So that's it from me very quickly and I think I kept the time. So I'll hand back over to Laura. So what we'd like to do now is we'd like to get the list of questions that you have. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of group them and address them to the right person. So really what we're looking for is clarifying questions here. Is there anything that Johnny presented that was confusing to you um, that you, you need a little bit more information on? Um, if so, we invite you to either come up and use this microphone, or if, you'd, if you're not comfortable coming up, you can just raise your hand and I will repeat the question. The reason we have the mics is because we're, we're actually filming this for people that are unable to attend the meeting tonight. So who has a question? Did you want to come up or? Well, I can just ask you from here, what are the funding sources for this? Okay, so um, you'd like more information on the funding sources for implementing the, uh, the plan. Great. Other questions, yes. 
Okay, so a better sense of when these recommendations are, what's the timing for implementation? So, yeah, what's the timing for implementation? And since you're right here, I'm just going to... In your analysis, did you look at joint uh, dovetailing with, like, the bus system? So, did we look at connecting this to other modes of transportation? Other questions? Yes. So how do we, what do we do with these 11 corridors? How do we determine which ones will be focused, the focused on first? Yes. What are the specific revisions involved in screening? <coughs> what does that actually look like for the 20, the early corridor for the 20? Okay. So, yeah, we, what, tell us a bit more detail about what the actual improvements will be on these priority corridors. How is that determined? What other communities of this size have gone through a similar process? Yeah. And to piggyback on that, those other communities... Actually, Susan, you're right here. I'm just All right. And to go along with sort of that question, similar cities, what have their funding sources been, say, across Colorado? So maybe not just what we're recommending as our funding sources, but like Fort Collins and some of those others, what creative ways are they paying for these infrastructure changes? Great. Other questions? Well, this is a pretty good list, so let's get through these, and then we'll check in with you again to see if, if any additional questions came up. Um, so I think let's talk about the, um, the plan, and then we'll get into the, the funding and the um, timing after that. But to refine th the information in the plan, um, let's see, how Connecting to other modes. So did we, let's start with Johnny, and if you, if you want to forward these to anyone else, just let me know. But did we, um, in our plan, discuss, did, did connection to other modes come into play at all in the plan? Yeah, it definitely did. Um, we uh, mapped out the sidewalks um, throughout the region and also the transit stops. Um, and we used that to help us guide us towards the corridor analysis. So. We definitely use transit and how you connect to transit um, as um, multimodal journeys. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the next step for identifying specific corridor improvement details? So like how do, how do we go from having identified a route to developing specific plans for what the improvements will be? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it goes through quite a, a, a longish process where we work with the jurisdiction where the corridor falls. So some of the corridors fall in the city, um, some of them fall in El Paso County, and some of them will be in the city of Woodland Park. And we, as we define, refine the alignments and the improvements, we work with those jurisdictions to see what they would like in um, those improvements. And then we reference our design guide um, that has a whole list of uh, the standardized improvements that we'd like to see. What we did as, as part of this process was we um, set a level to every road in the region um, on how difficult it was to cycle on or cross by, by walking. And that can help inform what type of infrastructure and what sort of improvement you should put on that road. For example, if you have a very busy road that has 60 mile an hour um, traffic um, with six lanes in each direction, you might want to look at an underpass instead of an actual grade crossing at that point. Um, similarly, you might want to not put a cycle lane on that road. You might want to pr uh, produce a, a cycle track to the side or a protected lane or something of that nature. So through our analysis, we created a, a layer that could help inform going forward how you can imp implement improvements in each of these corridors. And is it true that, that that's really taking care, the, the figuring it out, the details is done during the design phase, is that yes. right? Yes. At this point, we just go to um, alignment level, really, and we do do some improvements, but then that will go to the individual jurisdictions to really hammer out the details, um, because it's really in their jurisdiction, and how they do that is really up to them. So we get to that point, and then we hand it over, and then 
help, help, they can help uh, work out how to actually implement the improvements. Which is one of the reasons that interactive map is very helpful. So the, the, the way the information for that interactive map is going to be used is that you can zoom in and you can say, you know, there's a real challenge at this intersection or I think there needs to be this type of improvement in this area and that information will be shared with the jurisdiction so that they can utilize that in future planning efforts. Okay, um, how about, how do we, now that we have our 11 top improvement corridors, how do we prioritize which we focus on first? Um, well, that's part of this process. Um, for the 11 um, in, uh, routes that we have right here, uh, we'd like you to go and put which is your priority. Um, we'll also be looking at how difficult it is to implement as to how quickly that can be done. Um, some, uh, one of the route in particular that goes, that follows um, Academy Boulevard is going to be very uh, difficult to implement. It's going to be very costly, so it might take longer. Okay. Great. And there's a, um, and, and Craig would like to add to that as well. Craig Casper from Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. All right. Um, w for the regional plan, we don't deal with the project specifics until there's a request for federal or state funds for it. That request is made by the local entities, the city of Colorado Springs, Manitou Springs, El Paso County, uh, whichever jurisdiction will say, here's a project we want to do. PPACG will go through a process to score those projects to see which ones serve the regional interest the best, and then we will select those for the state and federal funds. So the actual specific projects come through the local entities, local jurisdictions. So. Um, and while you're up here, Craig, you might want to just stay up here. <laughs> um, just in case, case, but I'm going to switch to funding now. So, um, so, the f so the first question is what a little bit more detail about what the funding sources are and related. You know, what are other communities? What are other communities in Colorado using any different funding sources than what we would be looking at? Um, with the three uh, PP at PPACG, we have three primary funding sources. We have one called TAP. Uh, that's a federal funding source that stands for Transportation Alternatives Program, and that's the one we traditionally use to do our non-motorized projects. We also have a funding source called CMAC. It's for congestion mitigation and air quality, and it's for projects that improve the air quality in the Pikes Peak region. That one is not one we traditionally use in the Pikes Peak area to fund non-motorized improvements, but other places, Denver, um, most other places, that is the what it's primarily used for is funding off-road trails. Um, we haven't traditionally done that in the Pikes Peak area, but it, it's fully eligible. The third source we have is uh, a general s source we call Metro, and it could be used for any, th any bike trails that we use it. Uh, it's paying for part of the Cimarron interchange upgrades, paying for part of the Fillmore interchange, it paid for some of the I-25 widening. It can be used for anything. It's our largest source of funds, but it can also be used for uh, non motorized sources. Um, other sources of funds, uh, the PPRTA, we actually have an advantage um, yeah, in our area, and especially the City of Colorado Springs, they have a category for non-motorized type improvements. It's a, a pot of money that they will be going through a process to figure out what um, sources of funds are. Um, and, the, and CDOT, the Colorado DOT, also has a, a call for projects for non-motorized specific projects. Um, it's statewide. We will compete very well because they take into account the population in an area that will be served by a non-motorized project. And so through the Colorado DOT, um, there's a call for projects and uh, PPACG staff help local entities uh, with those uh, applications if needed. So, Bike paths? Bike tax. Um, that's a, for City of Colorado Springs and, they, and uh, only. And they do use that. Actually, it paid for part of this planning study, I believe. Can um, you describe what the bike tax is? Uh, and I forget how much it is. For every bicycle sold in the city limits of Colorado Springs, it's $4. Uh, there's a tax, a flat fee of $4 on that uh, bike that goes into a, a pool of money, and then that is used um, for bicycle-related improvements, or in this case, part of the planning study. So. And do you, know, can you, do you know of any other funding sources that other communities might use that are different? Uh, there's there's some health uh, grants. We haven't. I actually have no experience with that. Um, but there are uh, some health related, um, both private and um, f like grant uh, type sources of funds. Again, I, I don't have any experience with that myself. But I know there are people in the region that do. So, I think the Colorado Health Foundation has 
um, does, have, does have part of money for infrastructure specific. So if you look at the Colorado Health Foundation, you might find a bit more about that. All right, related to funding is the timing of implementation. So um, can you say a little bit more about time, time frames? Uh, we will be going through a call for projects in the next year to fund uh, non-motor, or all, all uh, categories of projects uh, for implementation between uh, now and 2020, possibly longer, um, 2016 to 2020. So th the local entities will uh, be bringing some projects in there. And then every year or every other year after that, it's like we're on a sort of a hamster wheel when we do these call for projects. So every year, every other year, we go through another call. Okay, now what are the best projects? Now what are the best projects? Um, and we get, the, again, those are submitted by the local entities to the region for evaluation. Okay. So in the next year, we'll be doing a, a pretty big uh, process to, to figure out our next projects. And I think the last question is, um, can you talk about, our, do other communities do a similar plans like this? Is this? Uh, other communities do uh, similar plans in general. Uh, some of the things we did are, I won't say unique, but are pretty rare. The, uh, what Johnny did gathering the uh, pavement condition data and the writability the, you, uh, for each road, how suitable, suitability, that's the word I was looking for, suitability analysis, that's pretty rare. Uh, actually, because of the process we've gone through, the, uh, there's been state and national conferences that we've presented this process as a best practice on how to do this uh, around the country, so. Yes, another question over here. Okay, so are there other insights we learned that are not necessarily about non-motorized transportation but are useful for um, the health of the region as a whole. Uh, we, we actually, uh, for the previous long range plan, the 2035 plan, we actually did a health chapter. And so we had a pretty good handle on a lot of the health benefits already. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know, the fastest growing segment of the population in Colorado is not the baby boomers over 65, it's actually obese people. So um, that was one of something we found out with our last plan. and. S walking, simple walking is a huge difference in that, so. One more question, yep, in the back. So did we look at decreased carbon emissions at all in the planning process? Um, the most suitable place to do that is in the economic impacts analysis, uh, using it as a dollar value. We chose not to include it because uh, it's, it can be fairly controversial, and we wanted to focus. There's so much benefit, direct economic benefit, without that, uh, that we didn't want to, I guess, muddy the arguments uh, about you know what we include, what we didn't. We, so we, we we actually did a very our economic analysis was very conservative. Uh, we always chose the smaller number when when we're given a range of you know it's somewhere between X and Y. We always want the smallest number, and we're still coming out with tremendous economic benefits.